In this video, we'll look at corporate bonds as a way to generate higher return and income than you'd get with equivalent government bonds. We'll look at what a corporate bond is, reasons to buy them, risks associated with them, how to decide which ones to buy and how to buy them in practice. And finally, we'll look at the macroeconomic factors which will help us decide when to buy and sell corporate bonds. This video is sponsored by C-Bonds, a data platform for financial market professionals and investors. Let's begin with the definition of a corporate bond, and it is just tradable debt issued by a company. The reason why the company does it is to raise capital. The reason why investors buy it is to generate return. And I think the best way to understand them is to look at an example. So again, a bit of terminology here, the issuer is the company which has issued the bond. It can also be a government, but in this case, it is a company which is Apple. The issue refers to the specific bond which has been issued by that company. So an issuer creates an issue, which is the bond. And the bond we'll start off looking at is one which was issued by Apple, and this raised $4 billion for the company itself, which it could then use to invest in the company. Now, of course, you don't buy $4 billion worth of the bond in one go. It's split up into little pieces, which are then sold to investors. If we look at the minimum investment for this bond, you can see that the minimum settlement amount is $2,000, and then you can buy increments of $1,000. So you could buy, say, $2,000 face value, or $3,000 or $4,000 worth. Now, when we think about the name of a bond, the naming convention is that we'd use the name of the issuer, in this case, Apple. We'd look at the fixed coupon, which is 4.65%, and that remains fixed for the life of the bond. That's the percentage of the face value which you receive every year. So if you had $100 worth of this bond, you'd receive $4.65 in two installments every six months. And then we'd look at the maturity date, which in this case is 2046. That's when you receive your principal back. So like a human, a bond has a birth date. In this case, the bond was issued in February of 2016. Unlike a human, we know its precise death date, which is its maturity date. In this case, it's February of 2046. And when it was issued, the bond was a 30-year bond. Now, as I say, the income is fixed for the bond at 4.65%, but the actual yield you'll get to maturity depends on the price you pay today. So this bond, for example, as I make this video, is trading at about $91. So it'll go up to $100 at maturity, so you'll get some capital gain, and you'll also get that 4.65% income. And the yield to maturity will take into account both of those, the capital gain and the fixed income. And in the case of a US corporate bond, usually it's paid twice every year, that income, so it's semi-annual coupon, as it's called. So one of the beautiful things about buying a bond, of course, is that you know what cash flows you're going to get. You know when the coupon payments will be made, you know when the principal will be returned to you. In the case of a corporate bond, however, unlike a government bond, where the government can simply print more money, a company can't print more money. So sometimes they go bankrupt, and that means that your capital may not be returned at maturity. And this introduces a new dimension, which is credit risk. So why do investors buy corporate bonds? Well, if we compare it with stocks for a moment, if I buy Apple stock, then I've got unlimited upside. Of course, I've also got unlimited downside, but really there is no upper limit to which the price can rise. It can carry on increasing forever. At the same time, I can receive an income of owning the stock, which is the dividend income, but that is itself variable. We don't know what the future dividend will be. That partly depends on how much profit the company generates, but also on the dividend payout ratio that the board decides to have. And if the company misses out on a dividend, it won't be great for shareholders, they won't like it, but the company doesn't go bankrupt as a result. Compare that with bonds. If I buy a bond issued by Apple, well, now I do have capped upside. I know what my redemption value will be. I know what principal redemption I'm gonna get. I also know my coupons. So there is a fixed upside. This is why it's called fixed income. Unlike a stock, I know exactly what the coupons are gonna be in future, and they're usually fixed. And if the company tries to skip just one of those coupon payments, it will go into default. It will effectively become bankrupt. 
So one of the things that investors like about corporate bonds is the fixed nature of the cash flows. You know what you're going to get, assuming they don't default. But the focus is now on return of capital. Am I going to get my principal back at maturity rather than return on capital, which tends to be how we think about buying stocks. Now, of course, a huge company like Apple doesn't just issue one bond. So if we search for other bonds issued by Apple, and here I'm using the bond screener tool on C bonds, and are restricted to US dollar denominated debt issued by Apple, you can see that there are many bonds which have been issued. So if we go to that single bond, which we looked at previously, the 4.65s of 2046, which I've stored here in my watch list, we can see the price of the bond today is around 91% of its face value. So we will get that 9% capital gain between now and maturity, as well as the income. And if I choose this map, you can see our bond, which is shown here in blue, alongside all of the other Apple bonds which have been issued by the company. And there are many of them. They have a duration running up to 20 years. So we'd call this an issuer curve for this issuer, which is Apple. At the short end of the issuer curve, the yields are around 5.4, 5.5%. Then they dip down to a yield of around 5% around the eight year point, and then back up to around 5.5 for the 14 to 20 year part of the curve. Now, if we take that issuer curve and we overlay the US Treasury yield curve, so here you can see the equivalent yield for US government bonds of an equivalent maturity. Notice how the government curve lies well below the issuer curve for Apple. And this is why we buy corporate bonds. It's for that additional yield you get on top of the risk-free rate, which is what government bonds provide. The size of that additional yield or credit spread is driven by fears of the company going bust, its default risk. If the default risk is perceived as being higher, the credit spread will be wider. And if default risk is seen to be very low, the credit spread will be very small. And for Apple, which is a very high quality credit, currently the credit spreads are very tight indeed. So if we look at the all-in yield, that's the actual yield to maturity we got on this bond over time, notice how it does fluctuate. The coupon is fixed, but the yield to maturity will vary as the price of the bond varies and the market's perception of its credit quality changes. So what's driven the increase in yield since early 2022? Well, it's largely been the risk-free rate which has been increasing. That blue line that we saw previously has been pushing the yield up. It's not because the credit spread for Apple was widening, such that the all-in yield at the moment for that bond is over 5%. Now, what C-Bonds allows you to do is to split out the spread for the bond over time. So we can work out exactly what the credit spread is relative to that government bond curve. So when the bond was first issued in 2016, you can see that the credit spread was about 2% or 200 basis points. What's gradually happened over time is that that credit spread has tightened such that if you bought the bond today, the credit spread would only be about 0.5% or 50 basis points. And this is true generally of the credit market at the moment, which is that credit spreads tend to be very tight because the perceived risk of a huge set of defaults is pretty low. There's a lot of complacency, I'd say, in the corporate bond market. Today's video is sponsored by C-Bonds, which you've seen me using in the rest of the video. And for viewers of Pension Craft, C-Bonds has some special discounts. If you use the referral link in the description below, you can get a discount of up to 50% on your annual subscription. Now, C-Bonds gives you access to a database of over 800,000 bonds. And globally, it's in the top two platforms for bond coverage. It also includes 350 price sources for bonds so that you can ensure that the price you receive from your broker is a competitive one. You can also track your bonds via the C-Bonds watch list and also be kept up to date with new bond issues. The bond screener allows you to find bonds which are most attractive according to the criteria which you specify. And you also get a week's free trial if you just want to try it out. So if you do want to make use of our special C-Bonds discount, just go to the link in the description of this video. This is what the watch list looks like, and I can keep track of the bonds I'm interested in. So for example, here's that Apple bond that we looked at earlier. And I can add bonds, stocks, or indices, which I define, such as the US 10-year yield curve, to that watch list. And I can be notified about any changes in the bonds in which I'm interested.
For example, if there's a coupon payment, I can be notified automatically before it happens. Or critically, if it's a corporate bond, I can be told if the issuer has been downgraded. So at this point, I think it's important to come up with a financial health warning, which is that you really should understand that corporate bonds are risky assets. If the issuer defaults and you hold just one corporate bond, then you stand to lose a large percentage of your capital. For an investment grade bond like the one we just saw from Apple, you'd expect to recoup about 60% of your capital, but it really depends on the company itself. For junk bond issuers, you'd recover less usually, maybe as low as 20% or even less. So this is why it's critical if you buy single corporate bonds to diversify across multiple issuers, ideally across multiple sectors. Personally, I diversify across at least 10 different sectors and definitely across 10 different issuers. That way, if there is a default for one of my issues, then I won't have to suffer too much of a loss in terms of my total holdings. And as always, if you don't fully understand what you're buying, don't buy corporate bonds, certainly not single corporate bonds. So with that caveat in mind, we'll consider how to actually buy corporate bonds. Now in the UK, we've got the ORB market, which is the order book for retail bonds, where the bonds have been deliberately sliced into smaller chunks so that retail investors like you and I can buy them easily. And if you buy a corporate bond which trades on the London Stock Exchange, then you can hold it in an ISA, you can hold it in a SIP, or you can hold it in a general investment account. Now, just as with gilts, you don't have to pay capital gains tax on UK qualifying corporate bonds. However, it's not easy to find out whether a given bond is qualifying. So you can check with your broker, perhaps, maybe even check with the issuer whether this bond is qualifying. But for most bonds which trade on the London Stock Exchange, corporate bonds, you will not be liable for capital gains if you hold it in a general investment account. Of course, if you hold it in an ISA or a SIP, well, then you'd never have to pay capital gains or income tax. So there it's not really a consideration. And if we look at the brokers which offer gilts, but also UK corporate bonds, this is a list which I've managed to discover so far. There may be others, but these are the ones I know about. Now, one way to ensure that you are diversified straight away is to buy a bond fund. And this would be something like an ETF. It could be an open-ended investment company. And you can search for ETFs which are high yield or investment grade. Investment grade tends to be higher credit quality. High yield will be lower credit quality. And that will come with a higher income and a higher yield, but also a higher risk of loss. So if equity markets sell off, the high yield bonds will also sell off more, whereas investment grade will hold up better. So as always, there's a trade-off between risk and return. So let's say we wanted to search for exchange-traded funds that contain high yield bond portfolios. Well, I could use the filter criteria here on C-bonds, for example, and I've chosen fund type ETF. I've chosen the stock exchange to be the London Stock Exchange. I've chosen the fund currency to be sterling. And the investment category is fixed income, and I've chosen high yield. So here's the list of ETFs which that search pulled up. And you can see there are several to choose from, and I've sorted them by expense ratio from cheapest to most expensive. And as always, you should try and understand what's inside the fund that you've bought. So for example, if it's high yield, it will be lower quality credits. That means that it's more risky, and if we're entering a period when there's weak economic growth, usually these funds sell off. So the geographic exposure here matters. If it's a US high yield fund, then you'll be worried about US growth. If it's a European high yield fund, you'd worry about European growth. Another element is whether it's currency hedged. So some of these funds you can see are GBP hedged, so you're not taking the currency risk with those funds. One of the funds, the one at the bottom here, is the PIMCO Short-Term High Yield Corporate Bond Index Fund. Now that one doesn't have a lot of duration risk, and that means that if yield curves move up and down, its price doesn't change much, whereas a longer duration fund would be more sensitive to interest rate movements. So really make sure that you understand what's in the fund, read the fact sheet, read the key investor information document, and again, if you don't understand it, don't buy it. Ideally, also look at the price history for each of the funds through a crisis period and see what happened. Then you'll get a feel for what the risks truly are. So how can we choose the right bonds which are suitable for ourselves? 
And I could break this up into two categories. The most obvious one is reward. This is why we buy them in the first place. So what is the yield to maturity? If you're buying a single bond, then remember that if you hold it to maturity, you don't really care about yield curve movements. All you're worried about is whether it defaults between now and that maturity date. It's that return of capital which is really important. The coupon, of course, is important as well, particularly for high yield bonds. But if we add those two, the capital gain or loss and the coupon income, you get a rough idea of what the yield to maturity will be. What you can then do using tools like C-bonds is to split the all-in yield, let's say it's 5.5% as it was for that Apple bond, we'd split it into the risk-free component and the credit spread. And then the question is, is that spread sufficient to compensate you for the risk of loss? Now, nobody really knows what that default probability is, but if you feel you don't have sufficient compensation for taking the risk, then don't buy the bond or the bond fund. So now let's turn to the risk aspect, which is very important, of course, because these are risky investments. Do you have a handle on the default risk? If you have no idea what the default risk is, we'll take a look at the credit spread and that should give you a feel for the probability. A wide credit spread suggests a high probability of default. A tight credit spread suggests that there's a lower probability of default. You can also look at the balance sheet of the company to try and figure out how risky it is. Look at the total amount of debt that the company has issued and compare that with the amount of equity on the liability side of the balance sheet. If there's lots of debt and very little equity, then that's high balance sheet risk. If there's very little debt and lots of equity, then the probability of default is very low. You can also look at the income statement and look at the earnings before interest and tax, that's the EBIT, and compare that with the annual interest expense. If there's lots of profit and very little debt servicing cost every year, then you're not too worried, probably. Whereas if there's very little profit and a huge debt servicing cost, then it's looking a little bit more shaky and the probability of missing a coupon payment and becoming bankrupt as a result is higher. You can also use the credit ratings produced by companies like Standard & Poor's and Moody's to gauge whether a company is likely to default. Most bonds will have these credit ratings and for example on C bonds you can see how they've changed over time as we'll see in a moment. And then finally to gauge the interest rate risk look at the duration of the bond. Longer duration means more volatile prices and more yield curve sensitivity. If you don't want to take that interest rate risk, then go for a shorter dated bond fund or bond. The price will be less volatile and you may sleep better at night. But if you go for a corporate bond, the worry is always that the company is going to get downgraded and its credit conditions will worsen. It might have been OK when you bought it, but it may not be OK forever. So, for example, if we look at New York Community Bank, there was this story in the FT published in February of 2024, when the bank got downgraded to junk by Moody's, the credit rating company. Now, as you can imagine, the price of the bond plummeted as a result. So I've superimposed the credit rating history from C bonds onto this graph of the price of the bond. I've also superimposed a rating scale from Moody's so you can see what happened. Now, notice that all of the credit ratings from Moody's from AAA down to BAA3 are classified as investment grade. Then you make a big jump as you go down one notch to BA1 when that's classified as junk. So everything from BA1 down to single C is classified as junk according to Moody's. Now up to February the 6th, this bond was classified as investment grade. So that was BAA3. In fact, it's the lowest rung of investment grade. But then on February the 6th, 2024, it was downgraded and it jumped all the way down to BA2, which is in junk territory. And that's precisely when the share price tanked by around 25%. And that was over the course of a few days. So this is always the worry when you invest in corporate bonds, that they get downgraded and that subsequently the price tanks. And it may be that the credit quality of the company continues to deteriorate and it skips one of its coupon payments and it defaults. In this case, however, what happened was that the company's fortunes turned around and it actually got upgraded following another downgrade, of course. And we also see that the price started to recover. 
So you can see it's not like buying a government bond where the default risk is almost zero. It is quite scary in some cases, particularly if you go for lower quality credits. So how do we actually know when it's a good time to buy and sell a bond? Well, it turns out that macroeconomics is important here. So it turns out GDP growth, because this is a risky asset, really affects the fortunes of companies. Here you can see a map of the world painted according to the annual GDP growth rate. So if we focus on the United States, you can see the GDP growth rate, as I make this video, is a fairly brisk 3.1%. Compare that with the UK, and it's minus 0.2%. And it's pretty weak in the rest of Europe too. 0.7% in France, minus 0.2% in Germany, and 0.6% in Italy. So if you are going to be buying corporate bonds, the best time to buy them is when you're not worried about entering a recession. It's not when GDP growth is gradually weakening or rapidly weakening. It's when you're coming out of a recession that's probably best to buy corporate bonds. That'll be a period of growth. Profits will be increasing at companies rather than decreasing. And it'll be easier to service that debt as demand for the company's goods and services is increasing. Credit rating agencies like S&P also produce aggregate forecasts of what they think the default rate will do in the US and in Europe, say. At the moment, you can see that the default rate has certainly picked up since the lows following the pandemic. Currently, it's at about 4.5%, which is slightly higher than the long-term average for speculative credits. They also produce three versions of their forecast, a central case, but also a pessimistic case and an optimistic case. And the central case is that we're going to carry on at roughly this default rate for some time. The same is true in Europe. The default rate's slightly lower at 3.5% and it's going to stay there according to S&P for a while. That's their central case. So if I was going to be buying corporate bonds at the moment, I'd probably stick to investment grade just in case the pessimistic scenario materialises. Another critical thing is inflation, because this is like kryptonite in fixed income. If you've locked in a fixed rate of return and inflation spikes, then it's going to eat away at that fixed rate of return and make your bond worth less. If inflation's high enough, you could end up with a negative real return, and no one wants to buy a bond with negative real return. So the fact we're seeing disinflation across developed markets right now is a positive one, I think. Sure, inflation is stickier than people thought it would be, but we're nowhere near the highs of inflation that we've seen over recent months. So inflation is another key indicator to watch out for, particularly if you think it might spike in the future. That could be caused by things like energy shocks, or it could be caused by supply chain bottlenecks. But being aware of that is critical as a fixed income investor. And then finally, credit conditions matter too. So for example, in the United States, you can look at the Senior Loan Officers Survey, which shows you the percentage of banks which are tightening credit conditions. Essentially, it means loans are harder to get for companies or whether they're easing conditions, which means that loans are easier to get. So when this graph is red, it suggests tightening conditions. Blue means easing conditions. And at the moment, credit conditions are still pretty tight in the US. There's actually an equivalent survey which is published by the Bank of England. So if you are going to be buying corporate bonds, then probably what you want to do is buy into an easing part of the cycle when credit conditions are getting easier and it's not going to be the case that credit spreads will be widening and the price of your corporate bonds will be dropping. And of course, default rates might be increasing too. So I hope this has shown you that if you buy corporate bonds, it's one way to increase your yield above owning, say, government bonds. But that comes at a price, which is greater risk of default, particularly if you own individual bonds, or the risk of a price fall if you own a high yield bond fund, say. So by choosing the credit quality, which is suitable for the environment you're in, you can also mitigate your risks by diversifying across different issuers, across different regions. But the most important thing is to understand what you buy. If you feel as if you don't really understand it, don't buy it. Study it by all means, and then once you feel that you've grasped how it works, if you've looked at its history, its price history, and you understand that, then that might be the time to start to ease into that market. But I think that high yield and investment grade credit definitely warrants consideration in most people's portfolios.
Now, don't forget our offer from C-Bonds. You can get up to 50% off your annual subscription using the code which you'll find in the description of this video. And, as always, thank you for listening.